Miss Casey here, and we're so excited to be with you at this first week of summer reading. Um, I want just to take a really quick second and just make sure to tell you all, you should have your postcards. If not, then you make sure to stop by the library and grab one, but make sure you're doing your summer reading. Bring those back to the library. But for today, we are here with our first uh, performer this this week. This is Randy Miller. This is the Critter Keeper. I know you guys are all really familiar with him um, and we're so excited to have him and we're going to show you some fun critters. So here we go. Yeah, we're really excited to be here boys and girls. You know you if you've seen any of my programs before you know how much I enjoy showing these awesome animals that we brought today. We're going to try to let Miss Casey uh, hold a couple of these things but I don't know how she's going to do this so we'll see how it goes. I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm not scared of most things. No so. you're not. You do no, pretty well. I do. Yeah. Okay, you want to just do this first one right off the bat? I see guess. how it works out? I guess so. I don't think I'm going to let you hold this one unless you Good. really, really want to. No, Casey. no, I do not want to hold this one. Well, boys and girls, first thing we're going to talk about is a couple of arthropods we have. Oh, come back here. There we go. And this is an Asian forest scorpion. Now, this is an arthropod, and the arthropods are the largest group of animals in the world. If you could take all the arthropods in the world and put them in one hand, take all the people and put them in the other hand, the arthropods would outweigh the people. Uh, but some of them are harmful, a lot of them are very helpful, but this guy is basically harmless. I actually get stung by him every so often, Casey, and you know what it feels like? What does it feel like? Uh, it just feels like a little jab. Okay. And, and that's about it, because the venom is so weak. Good. But we do have scorpions right here in South Carolina. They're called the Southern Devil Scorpion. And I've never been stung by one, but I know I've talked to people who have, and their sting is worse than a yellow jacket. And they're a lot smaller than this, and their pinchers are smaller, and the venom in their tails a lot stronger. Now, it, boys and girls, that's a really good reason, though, why we shouldn't leave our shoes and our boots outside or in the garage, because there's no telling what could crawl in there. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't shake those things up, you might have a scorpion a little bit smaller than this guy in there. I don't and think anybody wants to put their shoes on and find a scorpion. I don't think so either, no. especially when you find it the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you something really awesome, boys and girls, because this is something unique to scorpions. A lot of people have heard or read that scorpions glow in the dark. They really don't. But if I bring a special light out called a black light, and if I shine it on the scorpion, look what happens. Now this is called fluorescence, and you're going to learn all about that when you get into middle school. It's where a certain band of ultraviolet light reflects back off the surface and makes it appear to glow. Some of us wear clothing sometimes that's fluorescent, and it shows up really bright under this. And this is something that's very unique to scorpions, Casey. And scientists, we don't have a clear understanding on why scorpions do this. And I was going to ask you why. They don't. Uh, there, I'm not, there's always theories, but there's really nothing set in stone, I don't believe. So, what? it's just a fun party trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, parties, you turn the lights like, off and, and everybody gets kind of freaked out. And I can turn around and say, oh, where to go? You know, and that kind of thing. But, but, scorpions have to have something cool, too. Yeah, they, they really are. <laughs> and and the, if, you have, here, if you have scorpions in your home, you can actually turn off all the lights at nighttime, walk around the black light, and you'll be able to find any scorpions that are out crawling around. Oh, that's now, cool. it's also good to know you may find some places where the cat's been that you didn't know mm, about because yeah. that's going to fluoresce as well. Anyway. Well, this is pretty cool. And even a dead scorpion will do this. Even a scorpion body part uh, will do it. The only ones that I've not seen fluoresce are when the scorpions have babies on their back. They don't fluoresce because their exoskeleton really isn't firmed up just okay. yet. So, so the fluorescence is in their exoskeleton, yes. not in the live parts of their body. Exactly. Exactly. That's kind of cool. This guy's got some big pinchers. We have a very technical scientific term for big pinchers like that. Do you know what that is? Big pinchers? Big honking pinchers, <laughs> yes. And so those big honking pinchers can give you a pretty good pinch. I actually have a, a scorpion at home. It's the largest species of scorpion in the world called this uh, South African flat rock scorpion. Oh, wow. And he pinched me so hard one time. And I have a pretty high pain tolerance, but he actually pinched me so hard he actually broke one of his pinchers. <gasps> And what's must really be made of steel. Oh man, I mean it, it hurt. But what's really cool too is that arthropods, if they lose a limb or even uh, break the pincher off, the next time they molt, they shed their skin that it automatically regenerates. That's amazing. It, it really is. That's why spiders, if they lose a leg, the next time they molt, they'll have eight legs again. Mm -hmm. Now these little guys are a forest scorpion. And so if you had a desert scorpion out here, it'd be a lot lighter color, uh, like gold or something like that, which, mm -hmm. it, which stands to reason. This guy is used to being on the floor of a rainforest, and so he's going to be a lot darker so he doesn't show up to a potential predator. So he can camouflage. He camouflages mm -hmm. just a little bit better. 
There's a lot of scorpions in the world, and obviously this is not one of the dangerous ones. If we had one of the dangerous ones here, we would not take that out. Uh, we would not be sitting here. No. Well, we would, but it'd be in a glass container. I would not container. be sitting here next to it and open. I mean, some of, those, scorpion. some of those scorpions have a venom that drop for drop uh, is about the same as that of a black mamba. Wow. Now, so, but if you're ever faced with the terrible choice of being stung by either that scorpion or bitten by the mamba, take the scorpion, because the scorpion's going to inject less venom. Will I really ever have that choice, though? No, Let's I don't go. think you will. Now, scorpions, what they do is you see that tail is raised back over the back. So when, when, if they want to get a prey item, let's see if we can get him to strike here a little bit. This will be kind of go, oh, rah, rah. Boys and girls, do not try this at home. I want you to remember I am an animal handling professional. And, oh, and see if he's, yes. You see, I'm not really worried about the stinger. It will hurt a little bit, but that's how they protect themselves. You know, the jab, you, that jab just, just got you just oh, got yeah, me in there, there but it didn't really hurt, okay? But plus, the container is so big, it's really hard to break the skin, too. Mm. All right. Hey, can I show you one of my favorite animals? I would love to see it. And actually, this animal I've had longer than any of the other animals that I brought with me today. Okay. So, can you get her? I wonder what it is. Uh, this is a Brazilian black tarantula, <coughs> and uh, she's a pride and joy. I've actually had this tarantula for over eight years. Wow. How and, long will she live? Uh, 20. Oh, wow. Wait until you see how heavy they are. Huh. Put your hands out here just for hmm. a second. It's okay. <laughs> when I let you hold or touch anything, if I thought it would hurt you, um, no. don't but, drop her, though, because... But I'm not you, a fan of spiders. I know so. you're not, but... But she's a soft, sweet spider. She, she really is. And she's heavy, though. Okay. She's a little heavy. I remember I held your smaller tarantula yeah. one summer, and she was... That one was not as heavy as this one. And that was probably a Chilean rosehair. Does she move very fast? Um, you, oh, you're concerned about her running quickly? Yes, I just, I'm not a fan of the running quickly up my arm. You know, and I'm really not either, but she's pretty, pretty large Good. body. She does move quickly now and then, but it uh, looks like she's pretty content there. In fact, I sense a little bonding time going on right now. And, uh, no? All right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm being very brave, kids. And what's really neat is when tarantulas shed their skin, sometimes comes as a little bit of a surprise to me because I, I go in, I think, oh no, she died. Oh, yeah. You know? But then I realize I'm not looking at the tarantula, I'm looking at the shed skin. I have seen the shed skin of tarantula, and it looks very yeah, similar. Yeah, it does. And like I, when a, when a um, scorpion or a snake molts, you can clearly tell it's the yes, skin. But yeah. So, uh, what happens, though, is the tarantula, when it's getting ready to molt, it will lay on its back and then work its way out. And you end up with almost an exact replica of the tarantula. Mm -hmm. And the, the new tarantula with its new exoskeleton, it's very soft, and so the tarantula has a little bit of a growth spurt. And so it grows then. Mm -hmm. And then it, that once the exoskeleton firms up, now I, when, when a tarantula molts, one of my tarantulas, I let, leave it alone for about a week. Mm -hmm. I don't handle it. I don't do anything. Because they're very fragile. Then. They're pretty fragile. Mm -hmm. I don't even try feeding it because even a cricket could do a lot of damage. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, we call that a sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> When, when an insect, you know, starts harassing one of my animals. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Anyway, so anyway, so anyway, that's so uh, how often does she molt? Uh, she molts well. She ha hasn't molted in probably about six months now. Although I will tell you that I made a little mistake recently. I was tired when I got home. I had a number of programs that day, and I accidentally put one of my rosehair tarantulas in with her. Oh no! And so. Um, yeah, that was uh, disturbing. Obviously, she won that battle, and she actually ate the other tarantula. And so she should be molting here um, in the near future sometime after that big of a meal. She normally eats several crickets a week. Oh, that's all? Keep them fresh water, give her, and a little place to hide, and she's happy. So the tarantula enclosures are not that big. They don't have to be. Uh, but she's big enough to where she can walk around, she can mm -hmm. get her water, and chase her crickets, and have a little place to hide. <laughs> and these are from South America. Most of the South American tarantulas you can handle. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, because like the Goliath breeding spider. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, uh, yeah, I do they, not want a piece of that. They do not play well with Ooh. others, but their venom's not that strong. The problem with bird eaters is their fangs are like a half inch long. Well, they eat birds. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> actually, and that's actually a misnomer. Thanks for really? being Really? Yeah. The whole What's reason it? they call it a bird eating spider is because when they were first discovered, they found one eating a hummingbird okay. and the hummingbird would like hummingbirds will do was got exhausted probably and the wow. spider being an opportunistic predator took the hummingbird but the name stuck mm -hmm. the the it's a ground-dwelling spider so it's very 
not probably going to get birds a whole right. lot. It's not going to be up in the trees. And so that was kind of a, a fluke. They will feed on rodents mm -hmm. and uh, frogs, small animals and, and insects as well, but not usually birds. But you know that it, it does add a lot to the drama. It does. It's very name. dramatic. Yeah. But I do hate when they misname animals like that because sometimes that happens and it can make it very confusing. It can. Mm -hmm. But it's what it is. This is a giant African bullfrog. He doesn't look very giant to me. Well, that's because he's not giant yet. Oh, okay. You have to understand, Casey, it was just a short year ago, a little over a year ago when I got this little guy here. Mm -hmm. And when I got him, he was only about this long. Oh, wow, so yeah. that much growth in a year? Yes, he was fresh out of being a tadpole when I got him. And what I like about these little guys is they will eat almost anything that moves. You wanna see this? Anything that moves? Just about. <laughs> okay. Just about. And oh, what he's I very have, slimy. Yeah, well, that's just <laughs> water because you have to keep the amphibians dry. Right. And so what I have here is I have some mealworms, and I want to make sure. Hey, I I know you see them. You just turn right. You just turn back around here and stay on camera, please. <laughs> but I want you to watch his tongue, and his tongue is fastened in the front of his mouth. Oh, really? It's not in the back like ours is. Mm -hmm. Ours, with our tongue being back there, it gives us the ability to speak mm -hmm. and also to swallow. And uh, frogs, their tongue is fastened in the front. And so it kind of flips out of their mouth and then flips back in. The other thing that's pretty cool is the eyeballs. Oh yeah. yeah, he does have really cool eyeballs. Yeah, but they, what happens is frogs will use their eyeballs to help push the food down their throat. Do you remember Jabba? Yeah, I do remember Jabba. Jabba, He's, Jabba the Hop. He lives up to the name. Yeah, Jabba, Jabba the Hop. Let's get him. And okay, sounds He good. might even eat something for us out here too. Well, does this one have a name? Have you named it yet? I just called, not really. Oh. Well, you remember Jabba. I do. This is Jabba the Hop. Absolutely one of my favorite animals to care for and to show in a program. Uh, such an interesting animal. And uh, he's so impressive. A lot of people are just awed by his, mm -hmm. the size that this guy shows. Now I'm going to let you hold him, Casey. Oh, great. And, and just keep those fingers still because, as you know, uh, these there? frogs will eat anything that moves. And uh, I have been bitten a couple of times by this guy. He didn't do it on purpose, but he just thought he was going for food. So and this is not a frog you should kiss? No. No, 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 no. Good. Because on the underside of his jaw, well, in, in his jaw down here, he does not have teeth. But what he's got is he's got these bony protuberances that come up. So if you can imagine upside down vampire teeth. Oh. And yeah. he's even got one in the middle too. And let me tell you, I found out on two occasions they are razor sharp. I would assume so, yeah. Yeah, and um, these frogs in the, in the wild, the males will fight. And mm -hmm. when I say fight, I mean knock down, drag out. And he is a male. He's got some really bright color right here, the yellow up underneath there. And, and he's gonna get quite large. Now right now, I think uh, he probably weighs a little, a little shy of three pounds maybe. That feels about right. Yeah, and, uh, but when fully grown, they can weigh over five pounds and be the size of a football or a volleyball. Boys and girls, now you know what one of my life goals is. I gotta get this guy up to where he's football size. He's the whole reason why I got the little job because I'm having so much fun watching these things grow. Mm -hmm. and, and he eats, oh, there, Ooh, if you want to get, yeah, put him down. Yeah, he eats, one day he ate, I am not exaggerating, eight mice in a single afternoon. What? Eight of them, yeah. And uh, just gobble them down. So it. how old is Jabba? Jabba's about four and a half years old now, but these frogs can live up to 40 years. Oh, wow. You know what I really think is interesting about these frogs, Casey? What is that? In the wild, in Africa, after the rainy season ends, the female bullfrog will leave her active pond where the fish and the turtles and the mm -hmm. crocodiles or hippos are at. She'll move up to a recent rain puddle. And once she gets to that rain puddle, she will lay her eggs there and then forget all about them and move back down the main pond. So over the next few weeks, those eggs hatch into tadpoles. And mm -hmm. remember, frogs and toads are amphibians. Amphibian means land and water. Right. And that's why if you have it, like in the military, we had amphibious vehicles yes. that were in, in and out of the water. Mm -hmm. So words, again, words, Words, words mean, mean thing. Yes. And so uh, amphibians undergo part of their life cycle in water. So the female bullfrog will leave her, her eggs up there and move back down the main pond. So over the next few weeks, those eggs hatch and the tadpoles start growing on their way to eventually metamorphosing into frogs right. at some point if they live that long. 
The other thing that happens to us, that hot African sun is beating down on that rain puddle mm -hmm. and it's drying up little by little. Yes. And that's where the male bullfrog comes in. When the male bullfrog discovers the tadpoles in danger of drying up, he goes to work using his powerful hind legs to dig a trench that will allow the water from the rain puddle to flow back down the main pond, taking the tadpoles with it and saving their lives. What a good and, dad! And, yeah, and amazing dad. Yeah, especially and, for the animal world. Especially for frogs, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not expecting that type of behavior in a frog. Right. Now, obviously, he didn't learn that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is instinctual. They're born with that instinct. This is what I do. This is what mm -hmm. my purpose is. So we'll try this one more time, and we'll drop that in front of us. See if he's going to take another one. He's got a frog's vision is based on movement. Okay. And so, uh, if it wasn't moving, he wouldn't show any interest in it whatsoever. Uh, it's kind of if you're familiar with the story of Jurassic Park. You know, I was going to bring that up, just yeah. like in the movie where. Well, um, that's because what they did, the and based on the book with Michael Crichton's book which is a great book, Two Boys and Girls. If you, you know, it's a little technical in places, but it's very, very fascinating and better than the movie. It's always better than the it movie. It always is. <laughs> I try not to re see a movie if there's a book out, unless I read the book first. You shouldn't, boys and girls, because the books are always better. Yeah. I can attest, I'm a librarian, yeah. I, it's official. And, and I'm gonna back her up on this because <laughs> when you're reading a book- There we go. When, when you're reading Good a job. book, you're using your own imagination to come up with the characters and settings and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You're not relying on some, some screenplay guy, you mm -hmm. know? But anyway, that's Jabba the Hop, and uh, he's an awesome frog. I do not keep my frogs together. If we put two giant African bullfrogs in the same enclosure, uh, one the bigger one would eat the smaller one, and I think we know who would win that little battle there. Yeah. That's Jabba the Hop. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Toadie Soprano, and he is a cane toad. Now, a lot of people, want, when I'm talking about them, people th hear king toad. Like oh, a king, yeah. royalty? No, that's not it. He does king. look like a king. He does. But I mean, he, but he's like king it. of the cane toads, you know. <laughs> and uh, cane is like sugar cane or candy cane. Mm -hmm. So cane toad. And these toads are not supposed to be here in the United States, but they are. Right. Uh, they were brought in uh, probably several decades ago from South America to help control bugs that were eating sugar cane, like in Florida oh, and yeah. Texas, and also Australia and Hawaii. Uh, the problem with that is that they didn't think this all the way through. These toads are pretty poisonous, mm. okay? They usually and, don't think it all, no, they all they the don't. way through, but... And, and so there's nothing in the new areas... They, when they brought the toads in, they didn't bring the natural predators from South America. That would have wreaked even more havoc, okay? But anyway, um, nothing eats a cane toad twice up here in South Carolina, <laughs> or, in, or in, in Florida, or Texas, I mean. Uh, and if you see these big bumps behind the head, these are called parotid glands. Oh, yeah. And when the toad gets stressed out, uh, this white, looks like runny Elmer's glue will just ooze mm -hmm. out of these, these the pores. I don't know if you can see the pores on camera. I but, can. Yeah, but it just runs out of there like watery Elmer's glue. And that poison can actually kill a dog, kill a cat, kill a snake, can even make a person pretty sick. Mm -hmm. Now I'm handling, handling him pretty freely right now because he doesn't have the poison oozing out. Right, Okay. he's not stressed out. He's not stressed mm -hmm. out. And uh, I, it's, it's happened, it's where I just, when, when it happens, I just take a paper towel and mop it off out. and try not to have it in contact with my, with my skin. Mm -hmm. uh, these toads uh, were brought in, and then they're actually in South Florida, they have a terrible problem with them because people will let their lock dogs go into the backyard and oh, the dog yeah. finds a cane toad and wools them up a little bit and ends up crossing the Rainbow Bridge the next day. Right. Now, even with toads that we have right here in South Carolina, the dogs can, can do that. And those toads even are poisonous to a certain degree, but they're not going to kill a dog. They're just going to make the dog froth a little bit mm. and, and you take him to the vet just to, if, if that allays your fears. Uh, right now, Toady Soprano weighs about three pounds, but these toads get up to six pounds. What? Yeah. We might be able to hear this next animal before you even see it. Now, Casey already took a sneak and snuck I did, a I know what it is. Oh. There we go. This is Cotton Spike the Hedgehog. But Cotton Spike is perfect for her, or him, actually, sorry, because on the inside of his belly, you can't see it right now, but it's all cotton and on the back, it's all spike, okay? <laughs> Plus, sometimes, with his bedding, it gets caught into his spikes. You can see a little bit of mm -hmm. cotton in there, so cotton spike's actually the perfect name for him. He well, seems a little angry. He, he's always this way. <laughs> Hedgehogs are mammals, and this is kind of unusual with animals that I keep, because I don't keep a lot of mammals. Mm -hmm. Mammals typically involve a lot more care, a lot That's more true. interaction, mm -hmm. things like that. 
And plus, they don't deal with the stresses of travel like we have to do. The, right. You know, like a, a reptile or a... Or a They're just a little animal. more high maintenance. Yeah. yeah. And, and they are, I, I tell boys and girls all the time, if you, uh, hedgehogs do make nice little pets, but if you ever get one, don't keep it in your bedroom. Oh, why is that? Well, they like to get up at 2.30 in the morning, get on the exercise wheel, and it's digging, 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 mm -hmm. digging. You're not going to sleep. Plus, they snuffle and shuffle and snort and click. They make a racket. He's very noisy. He, he, very noisy for an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I feed my hedgehog? I don't know. What is it? Yeah, hedgehog food that I buy at the pet store. Oh, well, there you go. But then I also give him little treats like worms because he it, they're oh. actually insectivores. Well, we can do that. Sure. Might be a little messy, but... I didn't know hedgehogs are carnivores. No, they're insectivores. Oh, I see. Uh, boys and girls, herbivores eat plants and fruit. Uh, carnivores eat meat. Uh, insectivores eat... Uh, insects. Insects. And omnivores eat, eat almost everything. Yes, they eat a mixture of the two or yeah. of the three. And isovores. Well, oh, fish eaters. There you go. Say words mean things. Yes. <laughs> now, so we'll give the cotton spike here a little, a little treat right here. See, you see that spiky? Well, you'll see in just a second. You can put the worm there and. So <laughs> on that slick table, we can't get a grip on it. There. There we go. Oh no, he's back here, buddy. Yeah. Hedgehogs sometimes do this uh, phenomenon called anointing where they lick themselves and it produces a foamy froth on their spikes, which I think hmm. sometimes will make you itch a little bit. Oh. Yeah. So he's not cleaning himself when he it, does it, that? He is, oh. but, it, but it... It just froths up a little it bit. It froths up. And you know what? This, this On the surface, this worm, he, he kicks it out of the way. There you go. Yeah. And so what we're going to do, boys and girls, we're going to try to let Miss Casey Pet the hedgehog. This is always kind just of fun. Pet like yeah, this? Just, yeah. Uh, ah! Friends, the he is not scary. I just don't want to get poked too much. <laughs> he knows that I'm touching him. I know. Him. I know. <laughs> okay, buddy. I'll leave you alone. One more time. Now, now I want you to cup your hands. Okay. Ah! Well, but if you've ever. Just, you ever hear of a guy, you know, those, of those um, people from South Asia that lay on beds of nails? That's a, I would imagine that that's what this feels like. Yeah, because but see, if you, the more surface area that you have on the spikes, the less weight on it, and so it doesn't hurt quite as bad. It's not quite story. as bad as it gets. It does hurt. Ow, ow. It does hurt just a it little hurts. bit. Well, maybe you just don't have the pain tolerance I have, maybe. That's probably very true. Yeah. I don't know. I have toddlers, though. So. That's true. Yeah. But they, I think they're adorable little animals. They are adorable. I love seeing people's pictures, uh, you know, because hedgehogs have become a very popular pet right, yes. uh, recently. And people have very adorable pictures of oh, their hedgehogs. They're, yeah, they're really cute. This one's just very, very uh, uh, perpetual annoyed. Perpetually yes, annoyed, that's a good you know? way to describe it. Other people's hedgehogs are much more and sometimes friendly. If you want to see some epic cuteness, what you do is you just kind of curl them up to a ball like that. And then pretty soon they'll kick their foot out. His face even looks grumpy for him. He does look grumpy. Yeah. I think it's because he scratches his nose up. Yeah, I think so too. This is a very, very timely animal to bring out. Timely. This is an Argentine black and white tegu. Mm. Now, tegu is spelled T-E-G-U. Tegu. Easy enough. And this one is not fully grown. Uh, when fully grown, they can be over about four feet long. What? Yes. They have amazing texture. Feel that. She's not going to hurt you. Oh, it's such a cool feeling. It really is. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, a lot of boots and, and uh, things like that are made from tegu skins. Uh, the problem with these lizards is that South Carolina Department of Natural Resources is very concerned about these lizards being established in our state. As of August of last year, they were uh, reported from eight of our counties, including Greenville oh, wow. County. In the wild, you mean? In the wild. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how they got there, if somebody let them go or whatever. You know, it, it could be almost anything. It's a little different than what happened in Florida. A lot of people, you know, think the Burmese pythons and everything down there is a result of people letting them go. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but what happened in 1992 is Hurricane Andrew blew in, and it took out a bunch of warehouses that held animals that were destined for the pet trade. Um, a lot of those were Burmese pythons, boa constrictors, iguanas, tegus, uh, monitor lizards, and so South Florida being you know, a semi-tropical environment, yeah. they're, they're kind of living there. So that's kind of where that problem is. How these guys got to South Carolina, 
Just a, it's just a matter of conjecture right now. Okay. But uh, when fully grown, four feet long. Favorite food, bird eggs that they find Aww. on the ground, okay? And everybody's got to eat though. Yes, mm -hmm. but you know what? We don't need uh, turkey eggs disappearing and quail mm -hmm. eggs disappearing, duck eggs, geese eggs, because that's what they're going to be going for. Mm -hmm. Now, they also go for a lot of other uh, prey items as well. They, they enjoy eating rodents. Uh, that's what this one eats most of the time, uh, mice, but they're also omnivores. And so here in the wild in South Carolina, they've done uh, stomach content analysis and they found they've eaten a lot of muscadines. Oh. Uh, at home, he, she'll eat some cantaloupe and uh, um, grapes, mm -hmm. banana, things like that. Uh, every tegu has a different pattern. You can see all these little individually colored scales. Mm -hmm. And uh, the three different colors, usually um, black, cream colored, and white. And every tegu's got a different pattern, just like people have different fingerprints. That's so cool. Yeah. But they're pretty easily recognizable if you saw one on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, oh, that's a tegu, as long as you know what it is. Right. Okay. Uh, and if you do discover one, if you do see one, I don't recommend you go up there and try to catch it. Yeah. They will tear you up. Friends, you probably shouldn't try to catch anything that you yeah. see in the wild. I think that's probably a good rule of thumb, but especially a take Yeah. You know why I named him Mr. E? I don't why. Well, if it's a boy, it's Mr. E. If it's a girl, Mr. E. Mystery. Yeah, I hate having yeah. to explain that joke. I just gotta bring it up. But anyway, yes, you are a handsome fella, and you saw you the are, tongue buddy. coming out. The tongue was just like a, just like a snake's. Oh my gosh. Smells with it, and you can clearly see the tongue. He's getting a little squirrely on mm -hmm. me now. Hey, what? Oh. You got something to say? Do you have some? Well, this next animal we're going to show you has got to have something to say. I think. I have to see where she's at. <laughs> That's about as ideal as I'm going to get, I think. You got the big screen on up there? Okay. I'm going to try this. Oh, easy girl. Easy. Easy. Easy girl. Okay. I got her. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. Yes. <laughs> ah. Hi, cutie. She's adorable. Uh, this is a little female green iguana, mm -hmm. uh, obviously immature, but not so mature she doesn't know how to use that tail, her claws, or her jaws, okay? Uh, she's pretty fast. I adopted her probably about six weeks ago, I guess, mm -hmm. and she's doing fine. She's growing. Um, you know why I adopted her? I adopted her because somebody else didn't want her anymore. And that happens to a lot of animals. And I can't take every animal that that, that happens with, but she was such an adorable little thing. And ow, ow. She's really cute. She's, I will say she's the greenest iguana I've ever yeah. seen. And she's actually, uh, actually she was much greener this morning when it, you know, after, the, after taking her out of the lights. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, iguanas have three major weapons. Now boys and girls, I'm gonna have you try to guess what those are. Well, it's Go not ahead. their good looks. I don't know, they're pretty handsome. They are handsome. First weapon on an iguana is the tail. Now on a large iguana, and even with this one to a certain degree, it comes in three categories, Casey. Mm. Whipped, whacked, walloped. <laughs> I will tell you, all three of them hurt. On a large iguana, it leaves a mark. Mm. Uh, this tail is such an efficient weapon. I mean, they will cock their bodies away from you and cock that tail and let you have it. Wow. And I've been hit right across the head with a large iguana one time and I'm telling you I saw stars oh, wow. and I've had welts and this one even can get me on the on the uh, got me on the face this morning and that stung oh, for very a stinging, yeah. then of course there's the claws and the claws are very sharp because iguanas need to climb and grip things and all that good stuff and so yeah I've got some scratches on my hand from this girl Le leaves my hands a little bit less to be desired in the photogenic department but we're gonna let you yes that's so that's fine but the other thing they have... Teeth. Jaws, yes, mm -hmm. jaws and teeth. And even though iguanas are vegetarian, mm -hmm. they have a very powerful bite. And my nose is running a little bit, probably because I got hit in the face by a tail. And a full grown iguana, six feet long, mm -hmm. they can take a finger off with their bite. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Now, normally they eat uh, 
vegetable matter, fruit, mm -hmm. things like that. And we also have some some juvenile iguana diet that you like to eat, but you kind of like the that other stuff I gave you today or the other day too. Now she is a female, and we know that because number one, her dewlap that that's that flap of skin mm -hmm. underneath the throat is not quite as prominent as what you would see on a male, and the spine on the back uh, are not as prominent as what you'd see on a male. But the real way you can tell the difference is between a male and a female iguana is if you look at underneath the, the back legs, mm -hmm. the males will have pores that, on the underside that go kind of down the length of the femur. Oh, okay. And if they don't have that, then it's a female. But they, there's also other other characteristics like the spines and the dewlap that you can see. Sometimes you just look at it, you know, after you've seen enough of them, mm -hmm. you can say, hey, okay, that's a female, that's a male. There we go. All right. That's the joy of using a doing a live program. Yeah. You okay? Well, well, yeah. Well, you warned me about all of her um, yeah. weapons, and so I'm just a little cautious. Well, and, and as one should be. And you know what? She's got probably got a little stage fright going on today. This is actually her first time her being on camera, and uh, she is a sweetheart. We're gonna get a good name for her. And even boys and girls, when you see this video, if you've got some good names you want to throw out into consideration, we're happy to go ahead and, and think about those. But uh, but she's a sweetheart. These lizards are native from Central America down into South America and all throughout the Caribbean. But like we mentioned earlier with the tegu, they've been introduced into Florida. And they're also in the southern tip of Texas too, I believe. Oh. Um, iguanas, if you go down into the tropics of, of uh, Central and South America, they're, they're almost everywhere. Mm. And so they're very common and that makes them a nice food source since they That's are true. edible. Uh, and iguanas are really kind of cool because they're good climbers. Mm -hmm. And so what iguanas will do often, let me just make sure I got a good grip on her first before yes, she please. goes thrashing here on me. And uh, they will climb way up high on a tree branch overlooking a body of water like a river or a, mm -hmm. a pond. And if something threatens them from behind, like a jungle cat, like a margay or a, or a oh, yeah. oslet, they will dive off that tree branch head headlong into the water and then use this powerful tail to swim away just like what a crocodile would. Oh, wow. Yeah. And of course they can run and even mm -hmm. if they stand the ground, they're pretty formidable because they'll back up and you get them cornered, they're going to use that tail yes. on it and it's going to hurt. So what we're going to do now, Casey, I'm going to ask you to kind of slide that over sure. towards me a little bit. You're going to help me with this. Oh, great. It's always nice to have an assistant. And we don't want to take it all the way off because I don't want her tail okay. to get caught in the side of the where mm -hmm. the limbs are. Or the, there we go. Okay. She should be okay there. And there we go. Boys and girls, as intriguing as it is to keep some of these animals, I want your parents to know that I keep these animals so you kids don't have to on all of them. I don't recommend that if you want to get a lizard for a pet that the first thing you rush out and get is an iguana. Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Good, good starter lizard might be a, a leopard gecko or a, a, a bearded dragon. I've heard those are really They're fun. They're really great mm -hmm. pets. And then maybe, you know, if you if that's your if that's your area of interest and your, your talent and all that stuff, if you want later on, if you want to try getting an iguana, you just have to make sure that you're ready for it because iguanas are going to grow. Mm -hmm. And they can be big and they can be a lot of work, but they are not a starter lizard. No. You know what a good thing to do is if you're thinking about getting a pet is to do some research. Exactly. Where um, do you do that at? The library. Well, oh. uh, we have lots of books about pets, um, about wild animals, different things that you can come and check a book out and you can see if it would be something that would work for you and your family. Yeah. So you ready to see something else? I am. All right. Yeah. All right, boys and girls, this is an animal I don't use a whole lot of in my parties and, and public programs. Um, not because I don't want to, it's just... Uh, she can be a little feisty sometimes, so it's, uh, when I'm trying to introduce somebody to not being afraid of snakes, this is not the one I'm going to use, okay? But it's a beautiful snake, and she's not venomous, I'm just going to, she's not venomous, but she will bite. And let me go ahead and just kind of hook her here and bring her out. See if she hooks good. She has a lightning fast strike, so... Get the hook. There we go. There we're gonna hook her there. Now this is a blood python. It looks sort of like a ball python. They call it a blood python for two reasons. Number one is they have bright color along the sides of their bodies. And number two, they will draw blood on you in a hurry. And this is a medium sized one. They get much larger than this. Most pythons, you know, get over 10 feet long. 
but the blood python only gets the maximum of about six feet. Oh, back off the air. Oop, there. About six feet, but they get absolutely massive in the body. As big around as my leg, and I'm gonna get bit here if I'm not careful. She's just not hooking too well. But these, this one is from, let's see, to Borneo. Uh, down in, in Southeast Asia. And so you can see the camouflage the snake would have. Let's see if I can get her to kind of freeze here for a little bit, but she's on the move. The camouflage this snake would have if it was curled up in the jungle would be amazing. <laughs> I got the best job in the world, boys and girls. Anyway, oh, here we go. All right, okay, don't bite, hun. Don't bite, don't bite. And again, this snake is not venomous, but I don't like to bleed unnecessarily. And uh, even the head look, it's sort of like leaf, it's got, looks like a leaf. Hey, you are taming down nicely. You don't have no interest in biting me at all. That's good, because this snake is so fast with a strike. Let's do this without the hook. That old stinking hook anyway. All right, just don't bite, do not bite. I don't want you to bite me. Now, these snakes get absolutely massive. I mean, their body is big around as my leg, and they do have a lightning fast strike. So who knows what we're gonna see right now. I don't really like her climbing up this high. So hopefully, uh, no, no, not my face. Not this pretty face up here. You've got a pretty face too. Yes, you do. You're a very nice snake. Now, snakes are reptiles, obviously, just like the lizards we've seen, just like everything I brought out with the exception of the hedgehog. And so what she's probably doing right now, since I feel she's kind of cool, and uh, she's a tropical snake, I think she's actually trying to snuggle with me a little bit, kind of absorb some heat from my body. Because we, we generate our own body temperature, okay? Now a couple things about snakes, if you look up close, look at those eyes. Those eyes stay open all the time. And they didn't have any ears. Snakes couldn't hear the screams that Miss Jennifer and Miss Casey were squealing out a few minutes ago when she got moving fast. Uh, they're basically deaf, and they don't have any arms, they don't have any legs, and every so often you'll see that tongue come out. And that tongue is how snakes smell. Actually what happens is the tongue comes out and it waves around, picks up little order particles in the air, brings it back in the mouth, and there's an organ on the roof of the snake's mouth called the Jacobson's organ. And the tongue is inserted or brushed against that organ, and the odor particles are transferred. That's how they smell. Now, I want to see if I can work the plasma. I named her Plasma, which is blood, blood python. And we're going to try to get her off my arm without being bitten. And you are doing so good, honey. Yeah, oh, now she's going to wrap around. She actually looks a lot like a ball python. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. But uh, totally different temperament. <clears throat> Never see a ball python get all squirrely and start running around like that, like this one did. All right, well, you are a pretty snake. Yes, you are. Well, boys and girls, I certainly hope you've enjoyed the animals that we showed you today. I've had a lot of fun here. Hey, Casey had a good time, too. Uh, we had a few little moments of uh, excitement, mm -hmm. but that's, it just wouldn't be a Critter Keeper party or a Critter Keeper Definitely event not. if we didn't have a little bit of excitement. Yeah, if nobody squealed or shrieked or something. Yeah, I, I, I'm not doing my job right, okay? <laughs> but anyway, boys and girls, uh, this is Nigel, and Nigel is a Euromastix. I'm going to spell that for the kids. Good. U-R-O-M-A-S. T Y X. Nice. Euromastix. And that is the genus name, part of the scientific name of this animal, but we just call them Euromastix or Euros for short mm -hmm. in the pet trade. Euro means tail. He has a really cool tail. He does. And mastix means scourge, to, oh. to hit, yeah. to whip with it. So Euromastix, that's what it means in Latin. And every organism recognized by science, past and present, has a scientific name. Mm -hmm. You know, and those scientific names mean things. They describe the animal or the plant in some way. And um, they, we use those so that people who speak different languages, we know exactly what mm -hmm. animal that we're speaking about. 
Because in a lot of the languages around the world, Latin was the base of those yes, languages. Yes, absolutely. And it's actually, we refer to it as the scientific language mm -hmm. now. And so when you're looking through an animal book that you check out here at Pickens County, and you might see the common name of the animal, mm -hmm. sometimes in italics or in parentheses right. after the animal or the plant, you, uh, it'll be a really hard name to say sometimes. Sometimes it's not so hard. Sometimes it's easier than what we, we mm -hmm. think. But those are the scientific names so that uh, we know exactly what animal that we're talking about. Because different animals have different names depending right. on where you're at. And I'm certainly glad you invited me. But you know what uh, Nigel's going to do to the boys and girls out there? And what, what do we call that? A virtual lamb now? Is that yes. Virtual? Nigel, I thought everybody would like to see how pretty your belly is. And I would thought you might like to show them a gift of yours, how you like to wave bye-bye to the boys and girls. Nigel? You're falling asleep in my hand right now. He is falling asleep. Nigel, I can swap you out with a bearded dragon and do this every bit that... Nigel, wake up. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show everybody how pretty your belly is. I want you to wave bye-bye to him. Wave bye-bye to the boys and girls out there. Wave bye-bye, Nigel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Nigel. Bye-bye, Nigel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, boys and girls. Please don't forget to come by and see Miss Casey in the children's section. Uh, tell, thank her for letting me come out here. I thank you for letting me come out here. Mm -hmm. But I know that she'll give you some great ideas on great books, great stories that might just uh, be right up your alley. Thank you, boys and girls. Have a great summer. Thank you, guys. Bye.